good morning, everybody, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got some familiar faces in the crowd, but if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do 40 more broadcasts every single month. We just wrapped up with our Epic Oceans Week last week, so if you want to check out 20 programs live from Mozambique, Antarctica, Costa Rica, and more, it was a really incredible journey, and you can see all of those on our YouTube channel. We are in the home stretch, students. Some of you might have already done your exams. I know some of our classes in their last few days, in which case, congratulations, summer is almost here. And a big thank you for joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate some of the coolest scientists and explorers on planet Earth. I'm really excited today because we are doing a completely new topic for us. We've done 3,000 programs, so it's really rare we had a new topic. Uh, but Courtney Witcher today is a student joining us live in Tallahassee, Florida State University, where she's going to talk to us about finding fluorescence and glowing frogs in particular. She's had the chance to do some really cool research and go on an amazing expedition. She's going to share a little bit about finding glowing frogs in the rainforest, a little bit more about this black magic that is fluorescence, one of the coolest things in all of biology, certainly. Without further ado, I'll bring her in. Thank you so much for joining us today, Courtney, Thank and uh, welcome to the program for the first time. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, well, I know you've got a lot to share. I know we've got a ton of classes ready to see it. So if you want to dive right in, yes. we are good to go. All right. So thank you so much for that introduction and everyone for joining today. Um, like mentioned, I'm going to be talking about finding fluorescence and discovering the glowing world that surrounds us. So I already got a beautiful introduction, um, but I'm Courtney, like was mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at Florida State University. That just means I'm studying and getting a degree to become a professor and do research um, for my job. And my research right now focuses on the function, mechanism, and evolution of biofluorescent tree frogs, pretty much just how and why some frogs glow. And so in this talk, I'm gonna first talk about what biofluorescence is, then I'll talk a little bit about the glowing frogs that I study, and then I'll show you how you can also discover our glowing world. Okay, so I'd like to start with this image here. Uh, this is an artist's interpretation of a recent study's results that suggested we could use biofluorescence to detect life on planets beyond Earth. So biofluorescence takes harmful UV rays and upshifts them to longer, safer wavelengths. So a glowing planet could suggest that we're living um, that there are living organisms inhabiting that world that are using biofluorescence to protect themselves from the UV fluxes of their nearby star. But what I hope to show you today is that we're already living in a glowing biofluorescent world. This isn't just a potential way to search for life on other planets or a science fiction phenomenon. Fluorescence surrounds us. Okay, so this is what the world looks like to our human eyes. Take this in for a second. Now this this is the glowing biofluorescent world that surrounds you. These organisms are glowing right beneath our noses in vibrant colors that are often hidden to us by our human perception limits. Let me go through that transition again. The world looks like this to humans, but under fluorescence, this is what we see. So, okay, what's this glowing planet that we live on and this thing called biofluorescence I keep mentioning? In most simple terms, biofluorescence is glowing life or glowing species. But there are two ways that species can glow. These are called biofluorescence and bioluminescence. You're likely most familiar with bioluminescence, so let's discuss that first. Bioluminescence is the biological production of light. It's likely many of you have witnessed a firefly or a lightning bug in your backyard, or remember the glowing lure hanging in front of the anglerfish's face in the Finding Nemo movie, or maybe you've been able to paddle or swim through the ocean while bioluminescent plankton are out. These organisms all glow via bioluminescence. Here on the right is a depiction of the bioluminescent tree of life with representations of many of these glowing species. So you can see everything from fungi to fish, worms, insects, squid, crabs. Bioluminescence is present in many different types of organisms. But the interesting part is they all glow using the same exact mechanism. So with a special molecule called luciferin and some oxygen, all of these species glow in the same way. I want you to take a minute to think about that. Look at the diversity of bioluminescent species. Everything from this single-celled algae to the 46-foot long colossal squid glows in the same exact way, using the same molecule, this one right here. That's pretty incredible, right? Okay, so we have all of these glowing species that are bioluminescent, then what's biofluorescence? And how do biofluorescent species glow? So have you ever been to a bowling alley or a haunted house where your shirt or your shoelaces glow bright under the black lights? That's fluorescence. 
And when living organisms do it, it's called biofluorescence. And biofluorescence is another way that species can glow, but instead of producing their own light, they absorb light from the environment and then they re-emit it in another color. And some species can fluoresce in wavelengths outside of the range of colors that humans can see. So biofluorescence is like a special type of coloration. I wanna dig into that a little bit more. So let's take this hypothetical frog as an example. For coloration, light from the environment hits the pigment cells of the frog's skin and absorbs all light except in this case, the green wavelength, which is reflected and makes the frog appear green to our eyes. However, in the case of biofluorescence, the green wavelength light from the environment instead hits a fluorophore, a chemical molecule that produces fluorescence, and that fluorophore absorbs all of the green wavelength and re-emits it at a longer wavelength, at a different color. So in this case, the light's re-emitted as a longer yellow wavelength, making at least that part of the skin where the fluorophore resides appear yellow instead of green. So we see a shift from this green wavelength to a longer yellow wavelength. And one of the interesting parts of biofluorescence is that the excitation and emission wavelength, those colors that can be absorbed and re-emitted, is different for each fluorophore, for each of those fluorescent molecules. And there are hundreds of fluorophores currently known in nature. So fluorescence can absorb UV light and re-emit it as blue or orange and emit red. And you can see that the amount that the light is shifted varies. So fluorescence can be excited by any color and increased by any amount in wavelength. And that's what makes fluorescence so unique. Instead of bioluminescence, where we have all of these species glowing in the same way, fluorescent species all glow in completely different ways using completely different molecules. And if I haven't convinced you biofluorescence is interesting yet, let's take a look at the tree of life. We see great diversity of fluorescence presence and coloration. Biofluorescence is known in hundreds of species of fish, all scorpions, many insects, nearly all plants, and even some mammals. But why might we see this trait and in all these different colors? I want you to think as we're going through about some of these predictions, and I'm gonna give you a few examples in just a second. So let's look at those examples. First, many flowers have UV patterns, specifically this bullseye pattern that we see here. And it's predicted that this pattern is used by pollinators like bees that can see in the UV range to focus in on the area for pollination. So the UV bullseye pattern makes it easier for the bees and pollinators to find the reward of nectar and therefore aids in pollination. Here we have a red fluorescing scorpion fish perched on red fluorescing algae and a green fish near green fluorescing coral. And you can see that the fish are located near organisms in their environment that are fluorescing the same color, likely aiding in camouflage. It's helping them to blend in. And then here we have some jumping spiders. The top image is the spiders um, under natural light, and then the bottom image is the same spiders under UV light where you can see some of their fluorescence. And researchers found decrease in the number of courtship responses when UV wavelengths were removed. So males were uninterested in females that lacked fluorescence and females were uninterested in males that lacked fluorescence. And an example a little closer to home, fluorescence isn't always connected to a communication signal. It can be a product of cell aging. So we see this in the ripening of fruits. So in your bananas, maybe on your counter, the more ripe your banana is, the more fluorescent it is but also in the aging of mammal tissues. So these images here are from a four month and an 18th month old rat, and the white fluorescence in the brain is increasing with age. So theoretically, you could take a black light and use the emitted fluorescence to tell you both the age of your fruit and of your body. Pretty crazy, huh? Okay, so biofluorescence is the result of these natural fluorophores, these chemicals that fluoresce, and there are many of those, hundreds, and they all have their own fluorescent emission wavelength, their own color that they take in and color that they emit. And I want you to take just these few examples and think about some of the similarities or differences that you see here. Do you recognize any of the names? Perhaps chlorophyll, have you heard that before? What makes plants green allows them to photosynthesize? We'll come back to that. But like I said, there are hundreds of fluorophores, so each fluorescent organism is glowing in a slightly different way. And biofluorescence is the result of the absorbed light being re-emitted at a longer wavelength due to those fluorophores, those fluorescent chemicals. And the wavelength of light determines if we can see it and what color it appears as. So light acts as a wave and each color has a different wavelength, that measurement between the two peaks of the wave. And so the wavelength of red is longer than the wavelength of purple. And fluorescence is shifting the wavelength to a longer one, to a new color. So in this diagram here, it's shifting it from this blue color to the yellow green color. Again, think about how shifting this emitted wavelength of light or changing the color could be beneficial for an organism. Okay, so let's put all of that together. 
we have the biology part. Let's say we had this green leaf. We just learned that chlorophyll is a fluorophore, a fluorescent molecule, that it absorbs blue light and re-emits red based on the properties of that chemical. So if we were to shine a blue light on a green leaf, it would turn red via fluorescence. And you can do this yourself in your backyard with a little black light like this. We'll talk about that in a second, but you can see this change happening right before your eyes. So biofluorescence can reveal the unseen, whether it's the hermit crab and the shrimp in the sand beneath your toes at the beach that are exposed when looking with fluorescence, or the hornworms on the tomato plant in your backyard. We're living in this glowing fluorescent world that we just don't always have the ability to see. Okay, so now I wanna talk a bit about the biofluorescent organisms that I study, frogs. The first biofluorescent frog was discovered just a few years ago in 2017. And since then, researchers have found biofluorescence in about 35 amphibian species. And personally, before starting my PhD, I discovered fluorescence in five genera of frogs in Belize, and I documented the first notes of variation between individuals of the same species. So that leads me to the focus of my work now. My research aims to investigate the function, mechanism, and evolution of tree frog biofluorescence, the why and how some tree frogs fluoresce. But before I can ask why frogs fluoresce, I have to discover which species of frogs fluoresce. And that's the part of my research I'll focus on presenting today. So to test as many frog species as possible, I traveled all across the rainforest of South America, a habitat with a lot of different frog species, and I spent 10 weeks finding frogs and testing if they were fluorescent. So this looked like going out and collecting frogs from their natural habitat and bringing them back to the field station to test them for fluorescence. I'd place each frog under a light, an excitation light that looked like this. I would take photographs and then I'd use a special piece of equipment called a spectrometer to record their fluorescence. And then remember, we've talked about fluorescence takes light and re-emits it, and there are a ton of different fluorophore chemicals that do so in different ways. So I repeated this for each of five light sources, all the way from ultraviolet light to green light to make sure I didn't miss any fluorescence. And then I also took skin samples from each frog so I could help figure out what the mechanism, the, the how of the fluorescence is. So this resulted in a ton of data. Here are some of the fluorescent frogs that I found. So I have biofluorescent data now from 528 individuals spanning 165 species and collecting fluorescent measurements from each of those under five light sources resulted in over 17,000 spectrometer recordings. That's 17,000 new recordings of biofluorescence. So let's look at some examples of the fluorescence I found. Here are videos from a few different species where you'll see the frog in natural light, the excitation source, which is all blue light in this case, and then the filter will come across and reveal the fluorescent signal. The filter's just blocking out the light that I shine on the frog, so you're only seeing fluorescence and not any reflecting light. And you can see the diversity and pattern intensity of these signals. So sometimes we have fluorescence in distinct locations, like in the first video. Sometimes just the secretions are what makes the frog glow, like in the second. When I was handling that frog, there'd be fluorescence all over my work area, all over my hands after, because it was the secretions that would glow. And then sometimes fluorescence is just on biologically important areas, like the vocal sac in the species on the right. Now, here are a few more examples. And I want you to just appreciate some of this diversity again of the fluorescence, the difference in color. Look at how all these frogs turn out pretty boring brown colors, but then they're bright green and these patterns are revealed with fluorescence when you're looking for it. You can see the one on the right has crazy fluorescence that's super intense on the head, but also across the body. You can see patterns revealed. It's pretty incredible. So I want you to think about the variation in fluorescence you saw. Why might each frog have different patterns? You can see a few more here. This middle one, you see this pattern on the underside of the frog be revealed. The one in the bottom right corner has bright fluorescing eyes, and that's the only part that fluoresces. So what could these different patterns be used for? These are all questions that I'm trying to figure out too as part of my research. Okay, so I tested for this trait in all 528 individuals we captured, but how does that data compare to what was already known about frog biofluorescence? So before my expedition, 35 frog species had been tested for fluorescence since it was first discovered in 2017. In just 10 weeks, we nearly quintupled the number of species that have been tested for fluorescence over the past five years. And we tested all these species under those five different excitation lights when previously only one or two were used. And we saw the importance of this when we had several instances of exciting fluorescent signals in species already tested by someone else 
that were previously missed because the wrong excitation wavelength was used, the wrong light was used that the chemical wasn't able to absorb and re-emit. So in a fraction of the time, we added an enormous amount of data to this field. But with over 7,500 known frog species, we're just getting started. And that's where I need your help. So there's so much that we don't know about fluorescence. All of those over 7,000 frog species could glow, but we've not yet tested them. So we need you to be scientists too, and you can do this in your own backyard. You can take a light just like this one and help us learn about fluorescence by testing the plants and animals around you. And then you can upload them to our website so that you can have more information to study and that scientists can help figure out why and how this fluorescence is occurring. Here are some examples of completely new accounts of biofluorescence made by people just like you from around the world. All of these images pictured here are new discoveries of fluorescence that we had no clue that these species were able to glow until someone like you went in their backyard and tested them. So you can be a scientist right now and help us make these new discoveries. So with that, hopefully in this talk, I've not only convinced you biofluorescence is a cool and potentially biologically important trait that has been understudied, but this fluorescence isn't just on other worlds. It surrounds us every day. We live in a glowing world just waiting to be discovered, and you can help make those discoveries. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, um, and I'm looking forward to, to chatting some more about all this. Fantastic. Courtney, what a beautiful presentation. And thanks for leaving some of your contact information in this final slide. I'll leave that up for a second so that people can check out the YouTube video later and reach out if they have any additional questions after the broadcast is done. I've been sharing the Finding Fluorescence website both on YouTube and in StreamYard. So if people want to check that out and follow up after this broadcast is done, you have the opportunity to do so. And we're going to dive in with questions, folks. We've got our five live classes with us. YouTubers, you can chime in in the chat as well. White Hills, you're our one class that will share in the chat. So I'll be looking for your questions there. But I'm going to start with Miss Nolan's class. If you guys want to kick us off, unmute your mic and come on in for any questions you want about frogs, fluorescence, and the rest, uh, you are good to go. Hey, four fives. Hello. Okay. We have a question from Sultan in grade four. He's wondering, what is your favorite fluorescent frog? Ooh, that is a great question. My favorite fluorescent frog is probably... Um, there's these little leaf litter frogs. They live under the leaves in uh, in the rainforest and they're little tiny and they're really kind of boring frogs. They're really brown. They look like they have no pattern. One of the videos was of them. But then when you look at fluorescence, they turn super bright green. And I think it's that, I, I think they're my favorite frog because it's so incredible to see something that I previously was like, oh, it's just a little frog. I don't need to worry about that one. Maybe I don't even test it. Have it be the one with the brightest fluorescence out of all of them. And so that's probably my favorite one just because it was so surprising. Great question, guys. Uh, Lansingburg, we're going to head to Troy. If you guys want to come on in, you're good to go. Hey. What type of animals can I look for in New York? What type of animals can you look for in New York? Yes. There are so many animals that you can look for in New York. That's a great question. So first, the easiest one um, for plants and animals, like I said, all plants, if it's green, it'll have fluorescence. You can super easily see that transition from the green plant to cool red fluorescence. Um, you can, you'd be surprised what species have fluorescence. I've found um, mosquitoes that have fluorescence. So I'm sure you can find some mosquitoes in New York. You can look for um, millipedes or um, any other kind of little insects, beetles. A lot of those have fluorescence. Um, one of the pictures we had a, um, everyone has different names for them, like a sand flea or a sand crab on the beach. One of the pictures that was uploaded by a citizen scientist, it was actually from New Jersey, not New York, um, but in the same area, they found fluorescence of the little sand crabs of the sand fleas on the beach. And so there's a little bit of everything, Any anything that you could find that's safe to be able to test for fluorescence. Um, those, are, those are some good options that I'm sure you could find in New York. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We're going to unleash so many kids with black lights very soon. Yes. <laughs> um, I did just link in the chat to a whole a New York Times story on mammals with fluorescence. So it really is much more common than I ever knew it was. And that's yeah. what your research is all about. It's very cool. 
Um, St. Anthony, White Hills Academy, if you guys want to chime in in the chat, please do. I'd love to take some questions from you. Uh, Mr. Amaro, I'm going to head to you guys now. If you want to unmute your mic and share a question on behalf of the class, come on in, Ben. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, uh, a question that a few of my students asked was, you know, what got you interested in this in the first place? And kind of like, how old were you when you yeah. first uh, kind of were interested in this? That's a great question, um, especially because I didn't know that you could study something that you enjoyed as a job. And so um, my original interest, I've always really enjoyed being outside and asking questions. And I was very fortunate. And during high school with my Spanish class, we went to Costa Rica and I was able to see the rainforest. And that helped me um, know that I wanted to be outside for my job and wanted to be able to explore new areas. And so in college, I um, wanted to go into research. And so because I wanted to ask questions and I got a research position actually looking at fluorescent molecules, but in a medical application. And then I was missing the outside part. And then I emailed some people and I said, hi, I really like what you're doing. How can I get involved? And I was able to work in the University of Michigan Museum collections in the amphibian and reptile division. And so I got to see all these cool frogs from all over the place. And then luck was really on my side. And as I was applying for grad school, trying to figure out what I wanted to do after college, the first biofluorescent frog was discovered. And so my two research worlds came together and I was able to have this perfect new um, study species to work on. But it all started with just wanting to ask questions and then getting opportunities mostly by emailing people that I didn't know that did things that I thought were interesting and then using those to try to figure out what parts I, I really enjoyed and wanted to explore further. Mm -hmm. And then the more you explore, the more questions you have, so. What a beautiful answer, Courtney. Thank you for that. Um, Miss Megan's class, I'm heading to you and then I'll take the one from White Hills and then we'll do a whole other round because we've got tons of time, which is great. Uh, Miss Megan, you're good to go, Green oh. How did they hide from Predator if they glow so much? Great. That's a great question. So that's one of the um, one of the functions or reasons for fluorescence I'm trying to figure out if this could be used um, by predators to find frogs or vice versa. So I think there are two options. One, these frogs could be using it to communicate to each other. And then the, the predators can use that in order to try to find the frog. And then that's not very good. Um, but the cool thing about fluorescence is it's only taking certain light and re-emitting at a certain color. And so it could only be fluorescent under certain conditions. So maybe only at night when the predators are, aren't out or only during dusk or whatever it might be. The other option is fluorescence could be used to warn predators and say, hey, I'm toxic or you don't wanna mess with me. Look, I'm really bright. I might hurt you if you um, if you were trying to eat me, I might be toxic. And so that's where something like the frog that has those fluorescent secretions, that's probably, or my hypothesis for what's going on there, um, that's probably used to deter predators. So it could be a couple different ways of why predators aren't eating the glowing frogs. Very cool, great question, Ms. Megan's group. All right, Nicholas and St. Anthony wants to know, have you ever tested a poisonous tree frog? And could you explain if there's any dangers associated with that for our audience? Yes, that's a great question. I have. I was able to find a few when I was in South America. Um, I did wear gloves when I was handling the frogs so that I made sure that I didn't get um, any of the toxicity uh, touching me. Um, and they did have some fluorescence. It was really cool. But again, that's where kind of connecting to that last question, perhaps those frogs are using it to warn the predators, hey, I'm toxic, I'm brightly colored, not only in the visual spectrum, but also in this fluorescent spectrum. And so maybe their fluorescence better matches the visual sensitivity or how well the predator can see instead of the how well other frogs can see them. Amazing. All right, folks, we're going for round two. YouTubers, if you want to chime in with questions, looks like some of you already are, which is amazing, Mr. Chad's class. Um, actually, I'll, I'll go there first, and then we'll go back to Ms. Nolan in just a second. Uh, let's see. Ooh, what species of frog is the most dangerous from Cadence in Mr. Shaddock's class? Ooh, what species of frog is the most dangerous? Probably, well, the question is dangerous to what species? So if, if it's dangerous, we're talking about dangerous to humans, then probably one of the, the poison dart frogs, which is um, their genus is called Dendrobates. And so that's probably one of the most dangerous to, to humans and to their predators. Um, 
that would be that would be my best guess. But there are some some frogs that have some pretty pretty interesting um, other adaptations to try to defend predators. So. I remember when I was a boy, I was super nerdy about every superlative in the animal world, and the golden poison dart arrow frog was classically like the most poisonous. Like, yeah. if you touch it, it kills you the fastest. So, the interesting part, though, is a lot of those poison frogs they sequester the toxins from the environment, and so if you raise them in captivity and they don't eat the plants or the um, ants that eat the plants that are toxic, then they won't be toxic. And so they're simultaneously maybe mo the most toxic, but then also not the most dangerous in certain contexts. I love this. Like literally it's you are what you eat, which is very, very yeah. cool. So thank you for that, Mr. Shadows Miss Nolan, heading back to you for another one. Unmute your mic and you're good to go. Hey. Awesome. Okay. We have a question about the fruits. Taryn in grade four would like to know, are all fruits fluorescent? Like, could we do the black light experiment on apples, peaches, pears, or just bananas? That's a great question. Most fruits are, but I don't think every fruit has been tested. I know um, I've seen fluorescence in bananas, in peppers, oranges, but not everything has been tested. And so that's where you could help answer that hypothesis by testing the fruit in your house or your backyard or your grocery store or wherever you find your fruit. And so maybe that's something new that you can discover for us because I don't know if every fruit is for us. And that's a great question. There you go. We've not just unleashed them on the streets of New York. We've unleashed them in their own pantries. Um, Lansing Berg, uh, come on back in for us and uh, take us away. Hey, Troy. All right, so Vincent's wondering if an animal or predator eats one of the fluorescent animals, will it also become fluorescent? Ooh, that's a really good question. We don't think so at the moment, um, mostly because it seems like these fluorophores, these chemicals probably break down once um, something else eats them. But I, yeah, I don't know of any examples where that does happen, but no one has specifically tested that. Though I would assume, I would assume that they don't. Though I have seen frogs eat a firefly, which is that bioluminescent side, and you can see the firefly in their stomach glowing. So that's a little different. But uh, I don't think these are able to be sequestered to a new to a new predator. That's a great question, though. There's only one example in the entire animal kingdom I can think of of where an animal eats something that actually incorporates it. And so yeah. there's certain kinds of sea slugs that can eat jellyfish and literally take their stinging cells and incorporate them on yeah. the outside. Which, by the way, as a bi like no biologist would have expected that to be the case. That is so weird and odd and freaky that that is even possible. It's ridiculous. And I just linked it into the chat if you guys want to find out more. So I love the thought behind that question. Thanks, guys. Uh, White Hills, you guys have a bunch more questions. Let's see. Okay. Um, Corey, these are pretty short. Corey wants to know if you test snakes as well as frogs. As a snake guy, I appreciate this question. And Cam wants to know what was the most shocking discovery you've made, which you've sort of touched Ooh. on. I want to go for so... it. So... For the testing question, for my specific research, I'm focusing mostly on frogs, though we have um, with collaborations with other students or other researchers um, or people, um, I've tested a few snakes um, and there's some really interesting fluorescence in some rattlesnakes and some snakes that don't have a rattle but still move their tail like they have a rattle. And it looks like that part of the tail and the rattles of the rattlesnakes are really bright fluorescent. and so. In that case, they think that fluorescence is being used, again, as like this anti-predator def defense where um, the rattling of the tail creates the noise and this bright um, visual signal that's hopefully deterring a predator from, from eating the snake. So yes, I've tested a few snakes, but um, not as many as I have tested frogs. And then the most uh, exciting discovery that I've found, oh, there's been so many. I feel like my favorite part about studying this topic is that every single thing I find is a new discovery, whether that's uh, the fact that a frog has no fluorescence or has bright fluorescence or that a frog in my backyard has fluorescence. And so there's so many discoveries. I think my, my favorite thing has been finding local species that fluoresce. So ones in my area, it's, it's nice to be able to like go to the rainforest where there's a ton of diversity of animals and plants and all of that and and be able to test these these species. But I think that being able to catch a frog or a toad like on my driveway as I'm walking to to work and then testing that and seeing that it's fluorescent has has probably been the the biggest discovery because it's right here. I don't have to go anywhere else to 
to be able to discover that. And that's true for everyone too. It's surrounding us, which is really I was going to highlight that. So we do backyard bio every May. So we get kids all around the world going out, exploring their neck of the woods to find what wildlife lives near them. And I really, if kids haven't learned about iNaturalist, it's a tool you can literally learn about all the species that live near you. You can submit your own observations. You can take part in actual science, just like the Finding Fluorescence Project. So I really like, no matter where you are on this planet, you're in the middle of New York, which is classically not a place that's like a biodiverse haven. You will find it's teeming with life, incredible life, even in the heart of yeah. major cities all around the world. And that's a really, really special thing. So do check out those tools. And uh, I love that message, Courtney. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Romero, I'm heading to you for one more. Uh, and we'll go to Megan, uh, Miss Megan's group after that. Hey, Mr. Romero. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, we have maybe a, a two for one. Okay, so okay. two questions. The first question maybe is a little bit um, easier to answer and maybe you already answered it kind of. So we live in Northern Ontario and, you know, obviously we have some frogs here, but not as diverse amount. Um, could we find this, do you think, in Northern Ontario as well, if we tested some frogs or toads perhaps? or? Yeah, definitely. And, and even beyond toads and frogs. So I know that the diversity of amphibians. I'm originally from Michigan, um, which isn't Northern Ontario, but a little closer that way. And I know that our, our amphibian diversity up there is, is not the same as down here in a place like Florida. There's a lot fewer species, um, but you could definitely find it. It doesn't seem like this fluorescence is only specific to one region. It seems like in species all across the world, we're finding it. But then there are also other organisms in that location that you could test that you have that we don't in other places. There's different diversity of insects and plants and um, all of these different these different species could have fluorescence that we haven't tested. And I'd, I'd even make the argument that less have been tested in some of these um, more temperate zones instead of the tropical zones because there are there's an overall lower species diversity. And so we might not know even more in those areas because when people do research, we go to a place that has lots of species. And so your contributions of testing organisms across the board, amphibians and beyond in Northern Ontario could add so much more to science than, than testing them down here. Very, very cool. Uh, Ms. Megan's class, I'm heading to you and I'm gonna take one more question before we wrap up. Time flies and you're having fun, but I'll make sure all our classes have some research to keep learning going. Uh, Ms. Megan, come on in guys. Hey. Bit. Yeah, there you go. How, um, how glow every time? So do the frogs glow all the time or just at night or just in the morning? Question. That is a very good question. That's something we're still trying to figure out. Um, but from what I've observed so far, it seems like in a lot of frogs, their fluorescence is brightest at night when, so a lot of frogs are active at night. That's when they're communicating with each other. Um, with other frog species. And so it seems like most of them are really bright during the night and then less fluorescent during the day. And so there could be some kind of um, hormone or environmental regulation. So something that's influencing the frog like the time of day that's changing their fluorescence. And so, yeah, we seem, seem to be finding some evidence that it is changing throughout the day and that at night frogs are brighter in their fluorescence than during the day. I love it. Great questions, everybody. And then we're going to wrap up with just a couple more here. Um, are frogs your favorite animal? And do you have a pet one at all? Ooh, good question. Um, so originally, frogs were not my favorite animal. When I was younger, monkeys were always my favorite animal. I loved monkeys. As I've gotten older, I have very much enjoyed frogs. And the more I learn about them, I think the more I like them. And they're transitioning towards my favorite animal for sure. Um, but I, I love I love all animals. And so it's really, really hard to pick a favorite. Um, and then the second question, I don't unfortunately have a pet frog. But um, with research, we do have a group of frogs that we take care of at the university to help do our research. And so I get to kind of have um, a little bit of pet frogs, but but not truly. Uh, folks, thank you all so much for the enthusiasm today. I will highlight again, if you want to check out the Finding Fluorescence Wix site, it's there. You can check it out, find out more about Courtney's amazing work. Uh, go out and explore. That's our biggest message for today's broadcast. Leave I mean, as soon as you can today from class and go and see what local wildlife you can discover, whether it's frogs or anything else. There's so much magic out there. Uh, Courtney, before we bring in all our classes for a big thank you and farewell, is there any final message you want to share with our kids today about your work or anything you want to leave them with today? 
Yeah, I firstly, thank you all so much for being here. I think the biggest thing that I would say is you can find fluorescence in your own backyard. Um, on that website, there are links to buy little flashlights. You can get them for just a few dollars. The Finding Fluorescence site also has um, flashlight and little Finding Fluorescent kits that you can rent out or like borrow for free from the Finding Fluorescent site. So please reach out if you want one of those for your classroom. Um, and I hope that you all go out and can get to see this glowing world that we live in in front of your eyes. And so hopefully if you took anything away today, it's that. Amazing. Courtney, this has been so much fun. And what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. A few individual teachers, but Miss Megan's class and Lansingberg, if you guys want to join me in saying a huge thank you, you are all in the broadcast. Welcome in, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.